This is Models and Quantum Mechanics on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss the theory and principle behind the particle on a ring model. All right. Once we go into the basics of this model and discuss the wave function, the energy eigenvalue, and so on and so forth, we'll then go into the interpretation of what everything kind of means here. Okay. Let's consider a situation where we have a ring. So basically just a circle, okay, like your wedding ring, it's a circle. And we're gonna have a particle, and eventually we'll see this particle is gonna be probably an electron, but we're gonna confine the electron to be on the ring. So on this black circle, it has to be somewhere on the ring. The way we confine it there is in the middle of the circle where it's white or outside the circle, our potential energy is infinite. Okay, and on the ring, potential energy is zero. This is very similar to the particle in a box model, where inside the well, the potential energy is zero, and outside, it's infinity. We're doing the same thing, except the particle's confined on a ring. So the particle can be on the ring anywhere, but just not outside or inside the ring. Now, while avoiding all of the weeds and so forth, let's discuss the output of the particle on a ring model. We get a wave function. Now, this wave function is in terms of an angle called phi. Phi is this angle right here. It's basically, when you normally think of circles in most calculus or trigonometry courses, this is really your theta. In quantum mechanics, it's defined as phi because we're actually dealing with spherical coordinates eventually. So just understand, this is basically your theta. It's the angle around the circle, but it's defined here as phi. And the wave function is this normalization constant, one over the square root of two pi. And then you have this exponential function, e to the negative i k phi, okay? Now I will tell you this ahead of time. The particle in a ring model, when you get problems like the, uh, using this on a test, it's usually a really happy moment because dealing with this wave function, as we'll see in the next video, is actually very easy. This is a really easy wave function to deal with, but actually the interpretation of it is much more important, which we'll get to in a minute. This i is your imaginary number, it's a complex number, so when we actually do probability calculations or the integral where we have to do the complex conjugate of the wave function, the complex conjugate will have this negative sign removed. And that's gonna actually play a role in why dealing with this wave function is so easy, okay? Also, we have this k, which you see here in the exponential argument in this negative i k phi, K is going to turn out to be the magnetic quantum number. Remember from general chemistry when we had four quantum numbers. We have the principal quantum number, we have the azimuthal quantum number, usually L. We have the magnetic quantum number, which is usually denoted with an M. Then we have the spin quantum number. Okay. This is the third one. This K is the magnetic quantum number. In fact, on another slide I actually term it M. Um, and remember it can have value zero, plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, and so on and so forth. So what exactly is the magnetic number here, or the K? Well, forget the signs in front of these numbers. Just imagine it's their absolute value, zero, one, two, three, for a second. Now, this will actually make the conceptual aspect a little bit more understandable. It turns out these numbers are the number of lobes on each side of the horizontal axis, which is actually the phi axis. So what they've done here is they basically graphed the wave function xi versus phi. And it's a wave, okay, these are waves. This is actually the correct one down here. I'll show you in a minute why this one isn't valid. The correct one is here. So the number of lobes on each side of the phi axis or phi axis. So how many are on each side? Well, here's one full lobe right here. Here's half of one and here's the half of the other. So we have a half plus a half plus one. So there's two lobes on this side. You can actually see the two lobes down here much easier. One, two. So there's two lobes on each side. This one therefore corresponds to a K of two. Now whether this is plus or minus is irrelevant here. But the point is there's two lobes on each side of the phi axis, okay? Now, this, when you actually solve for this wave function, you actually get this constraint that k has to be a number, not a decimal, okay? It can't be 0 0.5, it can't be 3.8, it has to be, it can be zero, and it can be a positive or negative number, but it has to be these whole numbers, one, two, three, 
uh, negative one, negative two, negative three, and so forth. And why is that? Well, let's think about it like this. This case that's not valid up here, I'm gonna start right here and I'm gonna follow this dark blue circuit. Follow it, okay? Now remember, two pi is equal to zero, right? So when I come around here, this point should be right where I started, but it's not, it's down here. Meaning I don't come back to the same point from which I start the circuit. Therefore, this isn't valid. And this would be a case of k with something like 0.5 or whatever, okay, a decimal. So what I do is I constrain the wave function such that wherever I start the circuit, I have to come back around to the same point. So I go up, up, down, up, down, up, and I come right back to the same point because remember two pi is the same as zero because it's cyclic. So this is coming back to the same point, and it turns out that this wave function only does that when k is a number like zero, plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, basically no decimals. The wave function only does that when k is confined to these numbers. And because you're quantizing k, you're saying k can only take on discrete values, this is another meaning of quantization. You're quantizing k, which quantizes the wave function. It can only take on discrete values, okay? And we also see this k appearing in the energy eigenvalue. This is important, you might wanna know this. The energy is equal to h bar squared times k squared divided by two m r squared, okay? r is the radius of this ring, and m is the mass of the particle that's confined on the ring. So it's a pretty straightforward calculation. We can also use this formula, which we'll see in another video as an example, but the energy, remember, is equal to h Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength, which is also equal to the Planck's constant times the frequency of the particle, okay? We can actually use this to calculate the wavelength of light required to induce some kind of electronic transition, okay? So, these are the key pieces of information that you need to know for problems, but I'd like to go into a little more of the interpretation of the particle on a ring. So the particle on a ring is not just important because you can calculate you know, the probability of finding an electron between zero and phi over two or whatever. I mean, you can use it for that, but it has more important implications. So the million dollar question is this, how the heck does this little ring right here determine the shapes of the orbitals or their three-dimensional orientation in space? And the simple answer is they don't. They indirectly do. So we haven't gotten to this yet, but there's another model. It's usually the last one that's covered in a typical physical chemistry course. It's the hydrogenic atom. And this has different wave functions, okay? And it turns out that these quantum numbers pop up again. It just comes out of basically the derivation and all that stuff. These exact quantum numbers pop up again. And depending on which azimuthal quantum number you have, and depending on which magnetic number you have, you have a different wave function. And it turns out that if you look at those wave functions, what they look like, those are the shapes of the p orbitals, okay? Those actually get you these shapes right here. And here you have the various shapes of the orbitals. Here's your 1s orbital, here are your 3p orbitals, and 5d orbitals, right? And it turns out that these shapes ultimately come from functions that require you to know which azimuthal and which magnetic number you're dealing with. And so if you wanted to differentiate the p minus 1 and the p0, for example, these two p orbitals, they will have the same azimuthal number, but they have a different magnetic number and therefore a different function. And when you look at the functions, they end up looking like this. Now, we'll get to the hydrogenic atom at some point, but just understand for now that this particle on a ring, this magnetic number, does not right now specify the shapes of the orbitals necessarily, okay? Um, but what you can do is you can look at a 3D representation of the waves. And if you actually go and look on top of it and you look to see where the lobes are in space, these darkened ones are where the lobes are above the phi axis, the, the other ones are below the phi axis, you kind of see you have some sh familiar shapes. Maybe this m sub l of zero is the s orbital. Maybe these are the p orbitals. Maybe two corresponds to the d orbitals, perhaps. 
Um, so you start to get some idea of it, but we don't actually get the shapes of the orbitals, the true shapes, until we discuss the hydrogenic atom. And we're going to have to use the azimuthal and magnetic quantum numbers to do that. All right, but for now, understand what the wave function is, the energy eigenvalue, what k or m is, sometimes m sub l is, understand this. And in the next video, we're actually going to go and do some problems with particle on a ring. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure to like and subscribe.